Right, thank you very much, and it's wonderful to have been invited to talk here. And um, So I've been based at St. Mary's uh, for the past um, 15 years, and, and I've recently moved to um, the Michael Wren Hub in White City, where on the below, one floor below, there was this wonderful group, the Environmental Research Group. And, you know, the amazing thing is when you cuddle scientists up together, they actually start to work together. It really, it really works. And so we've now got two projects ongoing that are um, around this area that I'm going to be talking about, which is biological pollution. So I'm going to be talking about emerging fungal infections, but it's, it's really important just to bear in mind that exposure to fungi is absolutely normal. In it, it's expected. I mean, fungi were on this planet way before we evolved. And here we have this very happy chimpanzee cuddled up in its leaf nest. When we were primates in the savannas, we were in environments where we had all the exposure to the, the thousands, hundreds of thousands of millions of fungi that are in, uh, in our airs. Um, but buried within this kind of an enormous deep biodiversity of fungal exposures, there are those ones that um, can cause disease. And this has been recently played around with um, by the HBO series, The Last of Us, with the, the, the zombie um, fungal pandemic. So, you know, this, this uh, I, was, I was looking at the kind of the, the, go, the global budget of fungal uh, exposure in, the, in, in our airs, and it's, you know, it's really quite vast. Um, the, uh, there are 3.5 teragrams produced of spores in the, globally per year. So that equates to about three and a half million tons. So when you start to think about how many fungal spores that actually is, that's 3.5 3 times 10 to the 22. So that's four organic orders of magnitude more than there are grains of sand on planet Earth. So there's a lot of fungal spores in the air. And you know we've, we're absolutely able to deal with those in normal, healthy exposures. But there are unhealthy exposures. And that's where we start to see disease symptoms. And here's a classic aspergilloma growing in a patient's lung. And after cancer, clinicians fear fungal infections more than any other class of disease because they're so hard to deal with and to treat. And that's what we're going to be thinking about here today. So just going into our homes, this is where we start to see some really pernicious, unhealthy exposures to molds. And this is an incredibly tragic case uh, in 20, uh, 2020 of um, Awab Ishak, who died according to the coroner's report of mold exposures that had caused a hypersensitivity pneumonitis in this happy, healthy child. This is a, uh, a keynote case because of the first time that the coroner said it was exposure to the mold um, was the cause of death. So absolutely kind of key um, report because this is, this is, this is net, so at this point, the law can actually start to look at the exposures that we see here. So this is essentially a disease of poverty, isn't it? Because this child was brought up in this home and exposed to uh, a, a, an absolute blast of uh, mold bioaerosols, which eventually killed him. So this escalated all the way up to Michael Gove, and this was the subsequent report from the housing ombudsman. We've got 4.4 million social houses. Um, of about 4% have got a notable mold issue, um, and 2.2% uh, would fail the decent home standard. Um, the regulator said that you know, the vast majority of people living uh, in social housing are largely free from damp and mold, but those that do have such issues are at risk from serious impact on their health. Now, the, talking to uh, biologists that do home surveys, they say that the mold issue is higher than this. It's more like 50%, and that's, the, that's from the uh, investigator who did the report up in Manchester. So, you know, whatever way you take it, this is a large, deep, and pernicious problem. And now, it's, it's actually really quite simple, because when you keep a home damp free and with good ventilation, you know, well mixed outdoor air, then you're not going to have a mold problem and you're not going to have those high exposures that I was um, um, exposed to. 
But obviously, this is counter to the way that housing is going, where we're becoming obsessed with energy efficiency, you know, for uh, carbon neutral reasons. It's a very good one. But and if you don't actually build your carbon energy efficient homes well, then you're going to create mold problems. And, um, you know, this can be up to 50% in Europe. So it's, um, you know, it's something that it's, we've just, you know, we've really got to keep our eye on. It's probably got really quite obvious building solutions. This is just an engineering problem. Um, but from, coming from my perspective, we actually just need to be able to say that there is a problem, because you can't always see these molds. They can be buried away in the infrastructure of the building. You know, how do you know that the exposure is actually there? Um, this group at UCL does really good work on um, uh, UK uh, uh, moisture in buildings. And this is their statement. There are currently no established techniques for mold testing which would allow proper comparison of test results reported by different studies. So we need to lay down baselines, methods, and protocols for actually being able to say that this is an unhealthy building, and this is a healthy building. But we're not there. It really is the Wild West in terms of determining whether or not there is a problem in, um, in a home. So it's this, this is changing, and, and what's, what's really exciting now is with the advent of uh, um, high-throughput um, uh, sequ sequencing, we can start to use machines or even passive sensors to capture air and then to just throw it through the sequencing pipelines, which will then quantify the diversity of fungal bioaerosols, but also how much is actually in that sample. So we're holding out a lot of hope that this is going to be developed into a democratic protocol that we can, you know, can be used by housing um, you know, uh, agencies or you know, uh, whoever to, 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 to go and actually establish whether an exposure is, uh, is, is healthy or not. And the data that comes out of these uh, next generation protocols is really fantastic. You know, so you can, this is um, one of my favorite studies from a research group in Singapore that we work with, where they've just been running these small air samplers in, through day-night cycles in, a single, in, in single settings and sequencing the air and characterizing all of the bioaerosols. And I think, of course, includes um, the mites, the, the bacteria, absolutely everything. Um, and, you know, what you can see here is that, you know, as you go through day and night, the, uh, the composition of the bioaerosol changes. If you go into uh, daytime, you're dominated by the molds shown in brown here. This is a, a mold rotting down in orange. And you go into night, then the basidiomyces, the fleshy mushrooms, the, their spores start to dominate. So the fungi have partitioned up the day and night. So obviously, this exposure that we're seeing is very variable, it's very complex, but in, until now, largely unknown. But we do actually have the eyes to be able to drill down and actually look at what fungal biodiversity looks like in the air and what our exposures are. So that's just the mass of fungi that we're exposed to that's normal and healthy, but it can cause hypersensitivity. It can trigger asthma, pneumonitis, or whatever, but also buried within <coughs> this biodiversity are the hardcore fungal pathogens that the clinicians are really scared of. And I've listed some here. So this is just me shaking a puffball in the Pyrenees just to give you an idea of the billions of spores that are produced by a single fruiting body. And these are um, common fungal pathogens that a clinician would see. Aspergillus, Coxi, Histo, Talaromyces, Penicillium. I've worked on all of these. Um, and then the Basidia mycota, the mushrooms, there are some pathogenic yeasts. They're very small, so they fly, float in the air, and they'll go deep into the alve alveoli of the lungs, where if the patient has pre-existing risk factors, then they can establish these infections. Now, the one that we really are interested in is an absolutely ubiquitous exposure in the air. It's called Aspergillus fumigatus. Now, it's a thermophile, so it will grow at temperatures above 37 degrees, which is why it's a pathogen, basically. It, it's it's, it's, uh, it's, um, able to, it's able to grow in our bodies. And the reason it is a thermophile is it's the main uh, saprotrophic degrader in compost heaps. So it just loves the warm and the wet, and then it will grind away at all the biomatter there 
and rot it down. So when you see an industrial composter and it's actually blasting along and it's doing what a compost heap needs to do, then it's Aspergillus fumigatus, which is one of the major saprotrophic degraders. And this produces um, quite a nasty occupational hazard that needs to be monitored, which is the amount of Aspergillus canidia that are being produced by that industrial composter. This is a modeling study out of Imperial College. And um, you know, within, within 200 meters of the, of the center of the um, windrow composter, you're seeing very high burdens of uh, Aspergillus spores in the air. So they need to be monitored, and people who are working at these sites need to be protected. But then also, they're essentially a volcano for Aspergillus spores, which are dispersing across the environment. So, okay, that's, that's an unavoidable consequence. And health-related studies haven't shown that that's a problem. But what I'm about to show you suggests that there is a problem that we're only just detecting. Now, I'll, these are the patients that are at risk from Aspergillus um, and why we care about it, and including those with COVID-19. So a third of people who've got severe COVID-19 will come down with an aspergillosis of some sort. So when a, a doctor sees a patient with aspergillus, uh, aspergillosis, they'll reach into their uh, antifungal um, uh, uh, pharmacopoeia, and they'll come out with an azole. And this is what they use to treat the infections. Now, the few fungal priority pathogen list has recently been uh, released because what's been understood is perennially we've underestimated the amount of diseases and the threat that fungi pose to public health. And here we have this critical group that has aspergillus in it. Now, why is aspergillus in the critical group? Well, it's because it's evolving resistance to those azole drugs that the doctors need to treat the, um, the cases of the aspergillosis that they see in those risk groups that I detailed. So through time, we've had to uh, use drugs to fight fungal infections. And this happens both in agriculture and the clinic. So back in the 17th century, we used brining, arsenic, urea to basically um, keep our grains free of mold and to protect our plants. And then we move into the 20th century and we have the modern pharmacopoeia of agricultural fungicides that are used for crop security and then the four main classes of antifungal drugs that are used in the clinic. You can see the azoles there and um, up there. Now, what fungi do spectacularly as well is they occupy environments and they respond to their environments. And if there's selection in the environments, then they'll respond to that selection and they'll evolve some form of um, resistance or adaptation to it. And uh, this is a review that we um, uh, wrote back in 2018 in Science, where we showed that fungi, fungal pathogens, had evolved resistance to every uh, mode of chemical control that we've deployed against them. So they, they eventually just become resistant. They're very good at doing that. Now, the problem, and this is where the one healthiness creeps into my argument here, is when you start using the same category of chemical in the environmental setting and also the clinical setting. So the argument here is that if you evolve resistance in the environment in a pathogen that can then infect a human, then it, you may acquire infection that is pre-resistant to the clinical antifungal. So the reason that this is, uh, we know that this is a problem is through the use of genomic studies and surveillance to, show, um, to, to determine the amount of resistance that fungi have to these agricultural um, and clinical uh, classes of drugs. So through the last um, 30 or 40 years since their uh, introduction in the 1980s, uh, fungal species have been evolving resistance to the azoles. Rare back um, in, the, in the 1980s when the drugs were first introduced and then sweeping through. And this is the number of human and plant fungal pathogens that have adapted to the azoles. And you can see this ramping up increase of azole usage um, in the United States. You'll see this similarly in Europe, uh, in China, wherever. We're really addicted to using azoles in agriculture because they're what we use to protect our crops. They're essential for our food security. We then ask the question of what's the actual exposure to the average UK citizen to um, 
an azole resistant uh, expo um, aspergillus exposure. And we, we, we answered this through the uh, use of citizen science. Um, this project was led by Jen, who did her PhD on it, and she developed a really nice uh, citizen science approach to being able to uh, sample uh, fumigate, aspergillus fumigators from across the United Kingdom at single eight-hour time spots. And she basically leveraged the power of Twitter um, to recruit these, uh, these scientists and then to coordinate her actions. And so she used these four time points, the, 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 solstice, the solstices um, and the, um, the equinoxes, to have people expo expose very simple little passive air samplers in their homes. These are some photographs of Jen's uh, uh, citizen science days. These were then mailed back to her, where she then cultured the, uh, the, the fungus and then determined whether or not it was resistant to the uh, to, to azole drugs. So a huge amount of work. When she pulled it together, um, she essentially showed that uh, there, were, there was azole-resistant aspergillus in the air across the whole country. And she got some really good numbers here. She got you know, over two, nearly 2,500 uh, aerosolized um, colonies of the fungus. Um, one in 20 of those spores were resistant to terbiconazole, which is an agricultural fungicide. One, and then um, similar numbers were resistant to itraconazole, boriconazole, and isobuconazole. So there's a clinical antifungal. So you've got this dual resistance to the agricultural azoles and the clinical azoles. So we're, the cumulative exposure of the average UK individual is around about 22 days per year. So we're all exposed across the, uh, the, the time span of a year to this uh, azole-resistant bioaerosol. So, okay, so then you ask the question, well, where does this come from? And this is where we're currently um, working. There's, there's going to be a hot spot for the creation of these there's adaptive arenas where the fungus is exposed to azoles and, it's, and, and the selection is working in the, to, uh, in, on, on, the, uh, on, on the resistant genotypes. And what Jen then went on, she was tireless. She moved away from there and into soils. And her highlight finding there was if a soil uh, was taken from a compost heap, then the odds ratio was that it were far greater that it would have azole-resistant aspergillus in it. So the composts are enriched for, uh, for, for the, for the an antimicrobial resistance. And this makes sense because if you've got a broad exposure, um, a deployment of the fungicide across the countryside, and they're being brought together, uh, in green waste recycling um, pathways, then that's, and they have the high temperatures, that's where selection and the production of the bioaerosol is going to um, occur. So that's basically where we are in the next iteration of the program is to start to trace down where we go um, in terms of determining the amount of bioaerosol produced uh, in these different compartments in the countryside. But the, from point of view of actually thinking about the policy implications here, obviously we depend on these fungicides for our food security. So there's very little we can actually do with the current array of chemicals that we used uh, in, the, in agri agriculture at the moment. However, we are also coming up with new antifungal. We have a critical need for new antifungal drugs because the obvious reaction to having patients with high frequency of antifungal resistance, aspergillus, as you innovate a new drug. And that's what pharma does. That's their job, isn't it? And uh, this has actually been happening for, uh, for fun fungal infections. And companies like F2G have um, developed uh, a drug called uh, Alorafin. It's taken 20 million pounds and 20 years to get there. But this is a completely new mode of action, antifungal. It's absolutely desperately needed. And similarly, Pfizer have picked up one called Phosmanogepix, which again is a new mode of action antifungal. So this is great news. However, what you then find is that when someone discovers a new mode of action, it almost immediately gets co-opted for use in the agricultural arena to build a fungicide for use on crops. And for both um, the DHODH inhibitor Olorofim and the GW21 inhibitor Phosmanogepix, Fosmanogepix, we've now got environmental analogs. So 
the problem here is that we're spinning the roulette reel wheel of dual use again, because if these become widely deployed and we have similar selection for resistance there, then we're gonna destroy the ability of these drugs to protect patients against aspergillosis. And where the problem lies is, is when you go from the environmental risk assessment for uh, release of a chemical in the environment, the question of whether or not it's going to raise resistance to something that's in use in the clinic doesn't get asked. So there's no the crosstalk between the regulatory bodies in the medical sphere with those that are regulating the use of chemicals in the environment. And if there is a policy niche that needs to be uh, occupied and filled, then it's actually to get those two regulatory bodies to at least address that one particular question in their risk assessments. Um, this is happening very fast because the Iflufenoquine is now registered in the USA and Australia and it's now pending within the European Union. So these are my take home um, messages. There's the, the fungal exposures are ubiquitous um, and they're indeed necessary to mature healthy immune systems, but there's too much of a good thing. Uh, we do have a problem in our housing infrastructure, but we don't have good methodological protocols for actually quantifying that and determining when we have an unhealthy exposure. Uh, molds adapt and evolve in response to antifungal control, and this has um, evolved a persistent exposure that we're all, um, we're, we're all exposed to. And this is uh, not a good thing for those who have got pre-existing risk factors for uh, uh, diseases such as aspergillosis. And um, we critically need new mode of action and antifungal uh, drugs to get us out of that uh, resistance trap, but we're then going to re-enter it if those same drugs are then iterated for uh, environmental use. So I'll stop there and acknowledge the masses of people who've been involved in this work and our funders, and thank you very much for listening.